So we have a bit of a problem here. Today's video is definitely going to be absolutely phenomenal in my opinion. I have some interesting things I want to show you. Absolutely jaw-dropping and hilarious at the same time. I also need your opinion on something and I'm quite serious about it. So stick around for when I ask you what you think I should do. You guys usually have great recommendations. With that said, let's backtrack slightly. In 2016, I built the Office Aquarium. You guys will remember that one. We built it at this super long, it was eight feet long, very narrow, very short aquarium out of scrap acrylic, and we stocked it with African shell dwellers. This was the first time I introduced you guys to that world of these tiny little fish that spend their entire lives living in shells. However, obviously in 2017, I tore my old dilapidated garage down you know, laid a new foundation and built an entirely new building. And that process took me just one month. Now to make life easier and launching an entire aquarium gallery, we narrowed down some fish just to the rays as well as the Asian arowana and kind of rehomed everything else just to make life easier, not only on me, but so they don't get neglected as I'm building and doing so much that took so much time. But shell dwellers were the fish that absolutely impacted the direction of what type of fish we would keep out here. Because at the time, you guys were absolutely fascinated by these fish, yet you couldn't get your hands on them. They breed in such small numbers and weren't very popular, but today, things have changed. The popularity that we created put on a massive demand and almost everybody can get their hands on them. In 2018, we got our hands on some shell dwellers again, and by early 2020, we put them in 120 gallon and we added some frontosa to that aquarium. And that was the first time we ever got to experience shell dwellers with natural predators within the same aquarium. And that worked out well for almost two years. And by late 2021, which was just last year, we upgraded them to 180 gallon aquarium. We added more frontosa and we also decided, let's see what would happen if we took some shell dwellers and put them in with natural predators, what would happen? And then let's set up a 40 gallon aquarium with just shell dwellers and compare their behavior, breeding habits, etc. Because we had never been able to do that before. Now what happened next was absolutely mind boggling and I'm, and, I, and I'm clueless as to what's going on. It was also fascinating, but we'll get to that in a minute. A basic introduction to the African shell dweller. These guys spend their entire lives in and around shells. They breed in them, they raise their fry in them, they sometimes store food in them, they hide in them, they use them for cover due to natural predators. These are one of the smallest cichlids on the planet, yet one of the most fascinating fish you can keep in almost any size aquarium, and that's what makes them so appealing. Now, when I've been monitoring what's been going on between the 180 and the 40, I've been taking some interesting footage, and this happens absolutely every single day. All of the footage that you're going to see in this video moving forward was all taken yesterday. At any given point, you can sit in front of your African shell dweller tank and just be absolutely fascinated by the infrastructure and the miniature city and community that's literally taking place right before your eyes. Males are bigger than the females, and they are far more colorful. The females tend to be half the size of a male. Finally, uh, it's only, a, I think that's why I like fish. Males are finally prettier than females, but only in aquariums. <laughs> now this is where things get just a little interesting and a little out of hand if I'm going to be absolutely honest. You see, when a male wants to, becomes mature, it's actually mature, which only takes about three to six months, if that, these are a tiny fish, which means they mature incredibly quickly, he will find a few shells and he will dig up a spot for and, and position exactly how he wants the shells while the females don't really do a tremendous amount of work until they become parents so the females a lot of the times if there's a lot of them they'll spend their times mid-water I call that the club all up there shaking it waiting for a male to notice them and bring them home <laughs> again this might get a little inappropriate but it's incredibly sort of relatable not for me I'm, I, I, find, I find all my girlfriends in church. Anyways, the male will go ahead and pick one of those females, typically waiting until she's sexually mature, bringing him, her back to the shell, where they will lay eggs and fertilize those eggs in the shell. All the rest of the females keep doing the same thing. Keep hanging out at the club, waiting for some guy to come along and take them home. I'm joking about it, but if you ever meet a guy that gets his girls at the club, this doesn't end well, and neither does this story. Now we've talked about their name, the shell dwellers, and the importance of having shells, but is it absolutely mandatory? Because I can't tell you how many messages I get on, where are you getting all these snail shells? 
I just get them on, on Amazon. I look for escargot shells, extra large, extra, extra large escargot shells. But do you need them? Well, rock piles will work the same as long as there's some visual blocks. Some of the males will pick a different side of a stone and just create their own little homes, trying to entice females in, making it nice and large and uh, protected and safe and trying to find a female to bring back home. So we get a male and a female breeding, they're laying eggs, they're doing their thing, they're raising their family. What if you have more pairs? Well, males can coexist with other males within inches of each other. So long as each male has a few territories with his shells, typically I recommend three to six shells per couple, they're gonna get along totally fine. But the male typically doesn't go too far from home because the other male always got his eye on the other guy's girl. And he's always gonna keep trying to come over and convince her to come with him. Again, if you're, <laughs> don't go home with guys from the club. This is getting so inappropriate, but I love it because it's just, we could put this, uh, we could apply this sort of terminology or anything to anything they're doing. And I'd love to hear your story once you hear the rest of this one. Just make something up in the comment section below. I love story time and that's why I'm doing this. Sometimes when it comes to these guys that like to get girls at the club, that one girl isn't enough and he will go get another. But these girls from the club, don't tolerate their male running around on them. So what he will do, remember the shells? Well, sometimes when they have fry, the male and female can signal to the fry that there's danger. They'll flick uh, the, certain fin movements or open their mouths a certain way and the fry will dart in. Well, the male can try to trick the female into thinking there is danger as well. At times, if he can convince there's danger, once she darts into the shell, he'll go over to his other female, see how she's doing, maybe raise some babies and dart right back to the original female. If that doesn't work, he'll shove her into the shell. He'll keep nudging her and pushing her into the shell till she goes in. He'll run over to his side chick, <laughs> check in on her and be like, hey, how's everything going? No, I was just working late. Blah, blah, blah. As soon as she comes out and he notices, like almost in his peripherals, he'll notice and then he'll turn around really quickly and he'll dart right back to her kind of reminds me of what the dating scene is like today. <laughs> Anyways, the 40 gallon is now my Jerry Springer Aquarium. <laughs> okay, all jokes aside, I just want to kind of point out these funny little stories because they are absolutely hilarious. And if you ever get a shell dweller aquarium, you can run guests and new people that have never seen this fish through these like tiny little stories and what they're like and what they do. And people no longer think that fish keeping is just for nerds. I dealt with that for years. I'm still a nerd. You can't, you can't like flex fish keeping. <laughs> The funny thing is I originally convinced you guys how awesome these guys are by starting them off in an aquarium that had completely flat sand with just shells sprinkled all throughout it. And by the next day they had created this whole new area and they were raising their fry and doing all normal things without any stories. And I've always thought these other stories, always, always, always is the first time I'm kind of talking about it. But what happened in the 180 gallon compared to the 40? In the 40 gallon, all hex breaking loose. We got multiple pairs, countless fry. And that is something that we kind of expected uh, when I mentioned what would happen in a tank where they're by themselves versus the same fish from the same source put in another tank with natural predators. What would we see in comparison? Now, my thoughts and my ideas were conflicted with yours or some of you. I talked about the fact that they're gonna max out breeding in here eventually. Uh, fish and even animals are only going to breed in the amount of food that's required and, or the quality of the air. And maybe that tank is overfed because they won't stop. However, I also talked about in the 180, I thought survival of the fittest. Imagine if humans stopped breeding. In a hundred years, there would be no humans. And when faced with that type of adversity, we, we would breed and breed and breed and breed. Well, I don't think we call it breeding when it's humans. What is that called? So I thought while they're in that tank with predators, they would feel that pressure, that natural instinct of survival and continuously breed and breed and breed. And, and you know what happened? Well, when they were in 120 gallon, everything was fine. There was less frontosa. The frontosa were of course, just you know half the size of your thumb. And the rest of the aquarium was a tremendous amount of shell dwellers, which made me think like, okay, this will do, they did really well with just small predators imagine with bigger ones and how that would go and this is where it's you know borderline shocking and and jaw dropping and i go from you know looking at the most popular club in the world to nothing happened now i did hand select three pairs maybe it was four and there is no fry in that tank the frontosa leave them completely totally and utterly alone the only thing different in that aquarium is the water volume is bigger there's more frontosa, 
but the water flow in that tank is also different. It's far more powerful in a 180 in order to circulate that amount of water versus a 40 gallon with just a simple sponge filter. So it made me think maybe it is the circulation of the water. So for a month, I slowed it down to 10% of what it was previously. Still nothing. So my question to you guys is, and this isn't the advice I need, what do you think's going on? Am I wrong and maybe I don't have males and females? I mean, it's obvious. I've kept these guys for years. I, I can even e easily identify sexes at a, even at a very young age. Is it the flow? Is it the simple fact that the tank's too big? Maybe they don't have a sense of security. Do I not have enough shells? Or is that one of the higher trafficked areas and they feel threatened? Interesting, interesting, interesting to think about. I think I come to a conclusion of sometimes it'll work and sometimes it won't. For example, I have a Fahaka puffer, which is known to not be able to really have any tank mates, especially the slow moving Oscar fish, which would typically attack anything else in the tank or would try to fight at certain sizes and certain situations. Just sometimes things work and sometimes they don't. And you can't feel guilty and or discredit something just because you read somebody else had a bad experience or it didn't work out. It might just work out for you. And that's the fascinating part or at least one of the fascinating parts of the aquarium hobby. My question that I need actual advice on. Okay, one of the things I'm thinking about is taking some more females from the 40 because, I mean, there's so many club girls up there. Maybe they need to go to the 180 and, and, and you know, maybe the males are just more picky over there. Maybe they think they're fancier because they're in a bigger aquarium. Maybe they think they, uh, they need a higher value woman that's not at the club. Or I don't know. I think I'll do that. But one of the other things I was thinking of is what if we took a handful of shells and a handful of shell dwellers and put them in the 2000 gallon aquarium? What do you think would happen then? And should I can even consider doing it? Let me know in the comment section below. I guess the moral of the story is here. Girls don't take guys home from the club.